Les Halkins, course manager at Richmond Golf Club, joins us now on Turf Business TV. Les, um, first off, welcome and thanks for taking out the time. Let's just check how you are because you had a bit of a, a battle with COVID um, a little while ago, didn't you, last year? I did, yeah. La last year, just before the first lockdown in March, I, uh, I I had a pretty rough couple of weeks where I couldn't couldn't do anything, couldn't get out of bed. Um, wife was quite worried. Had the paramedics out to me to, uh, you know, get, treat me because I couldn't breathe and all that sort of stuff. But uh, you know, here we are, so eighteen months later. I'm still still with us, um, and uh, yeah, it's been an interesting interesting year or so. And in terms of, you know, we hear about long COVID, has it been a long, slow recovery or was it something that you kind of got back to normal quickly? Yeah, I mean, for quite a few months afterwards, right up until sort of like to August, September, I mean, bearing in mind I was poorly in the March, in August, September, I was still feeling pretty rough. And uh, my, my wife insisted that I went to the doctor and got sort of like checked over. So uh, sort of like another three or four months of tests and MRIs and CGIs and all sorts of different tests, whatever they were. Um, I was actually diagnosed with a mild um, coronary artery disease. So uh, I've had to go on a bit of a strict diet, lose just over three stone, and, and I'm on some little drugs now for the rest of my life. Did you learn anything about yourself over the last year or so through that and, and perhaps spent time thinking about how you do the job? I, I, I'll tell you what, I'll be honest with you. I've found that my tolerance of... Uh, stupidity has just fallen off a cliff. I just cannot tolerate people that are just stupid for the sake of it. Uh, whereas I developed the skill of taking a deep breath and getting on with it, now it just that skill has just gone. I just tell people that I don't agree with them now, and they've just been silly. So uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm sure it won't do me do me all that good as I continue through my career. But it's just I just can't help it. It's just there now. Could be a short interview then. <laughs> Do you think, you know, the industry as a whole and greenkeeping should learn something from the last 18 months? Yeah, I mean, I think that the way that greenkeepers have dealt with lockdowns and the situations that have been thrown at us, um, you know, some of the stories have been, you know, really encouraging and heartwarming. You know, guys that have done it with small teams and, you know, and then some of the, like the, maybe the bigger clubs and big teams have taken on you know, projects and stuff and they've made the best out of lockdown and no golfers. Um, you know, I think, I think like I say, the greenkeepers have done, a, done an amazing job. I think the, the clubs and the way that they ran um, and the governance in golf clubs, they need to sit and have a, a good hard look at themselves because, you know, there's been some shocking, shocking stories coming out of golf clubs that just jettisoned staff at the first sign of trouble. Uh, and now here we are experiencing one of the biggest golf booms in decades and they're all struggling trying to get staff back. You know, they could have just been a bit more, a bit more sensible and not have such a knee jerk reaction, really. Uh, have you seen that happening at your club or has it been pretty OK? No, I mean, thankfully, you know, here at Richmond, I'm, I'm pretty lucky. You know, it's a very stable club, you know, financially. And uh, through every single one of our lockdowns, we haven't furloughed any, any of the green staff. Um, you know, we've all been kept on and basically the golf course has been maintained the best we can. Um, you know, we finished off some projects this this winter. Um, last year, you know, we just altered the, the way we did things a bit and made the most of the fact that there was no golfers around for sort of like four or five, six weeks. So, you know, so me, me and my team have been been pretty lucky that we've all we've all been in and, you know, just, just sort of like got on with it, really. You obviously had your own battle. Did your team remain intact in terms of their health? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, one of the things that's amazed, that amazed me, you know, I was sort of like the, the only one, one of the guys that sort of like caught COVID. Um, I've got like a gardener. His wife works in a hospital and uh, he uh, he had a had a week, week off because he got it very, very mildly, thankfully. Um, apart from that, you know, the rest of the guys have all been fit and healthy, been really careful. You know, they've all... They've all been really sensible about it, and they've changed the lifestyle. They haven't been going out and you know partying and stuff. They've they've been grown ups about it, really. Let's look at how you got to where you are now. Then um, your career path has kind of had quite a rise, and and you've got to the very top in in your industry, if you don't mind me saying. Why did you choose greenkeeping, or did it choose you? In fact, uh, it's, it's it's quite it's quite a funny story. When when I was a kid, you know, I was at school. I was doing my, my GCSE exams and stuff. 
and the plan was to go back to school, do A-levels, and uh, I uh, I wanted to be an accountant. That was my thing. I'm good with numbers, uh, and it was, you know, just sort of like seemed like a, a, a good job. Obviously, playing golf as a kid, knew lots of people that were in that sort of industry, and they all had plenty of money. Um, however, life didn't really work out like that, and uh, the first first day of the, the, that summer holiday back in 1989, I was playing golf because I was a golf nut and uh, the, I saw the, the head greenkeeper back, back at the club and he said something to me. I said, oh. I said Chris, I said, these bunkers are awful. I went, can you sort them out? He said, oh, don't you start. Everyone's moaning about that. And th they were short staffed and it was back in the 80s and, you know, it was a different world. And uh, so we had a bit of a banter. I think he gave me a clip around the ear and told me to sod off sort of thing. You know, he'd known me since I was 10 years old. So, you know, and... Uh, Anyway, a couple of days later, he comes back to me and goes, right then, he says, I spoke to your dad and I spoke to the treasurer and uh, we're going to give you a job for the summer. He said, and you're going to sort the bunkers out. So that, that was the start of it. So I did a whole summer of raking and edging and moving sand around in bunkers and I absolutely loved it. And uh, say come September, ready to go back to do my me, me A-levels and they offered me a, a full-time job, going to send me to college. And you know, before the days of MVQ, it was the old City and Guilds. And yeah. that's what I did, and I've never, I've never looked back. So, how long did you spend? Obviously, after the summer, you started full time. You went through your, your city and guilds. Did you stay there for a while, or did you move on? I did. Uh, I was there for three years. So it was the old level one and the level two, as it was. And then uh, I, I, for some reason, I don't know why, I, I would use Sparshop College, which is down in Hampshire, and I was based up in Leicester. Um, but that's that's where I went. And then they started with the. The National Diploma, which was one of the first full-time college courses in in the country, and uh, it just seemed like a it seemed like a good thing to do, you know, get a get a proper you know sort of like academic qualification. So that's what I did. I gave up my gave up my job, and my mum and dad helped me out, and you know we I went to went to college for three years and did the National Diploma, and then got back back into the work. And you know, I think at the time there wasn't many people with the qualifications. So it kind of like stood out on a CV and, yeah. you know, definitely helped me in the early days. So after you'd, you'd finished college, what was the next point that you stopped off at? Yeah, so that was, uh, it was like July 1995 and uh, I went to work at Hansworth Golf Club in Birmingham. Uh, first of all, as the so like the first assistant and a couple of years later got promoted to deputy and greenkeeper when the, when the guy moved on. And it was a, it was a good few years. Um, it's where I met my wife, and you know, there when we got married and um, bought our first house and all that. So, uh, so that was good. Say it was it was there for about five five years, and then uh, moved on to my first head greenkeeper role up in Cleethorpes in Lincolnshire. So, how were you prepared from going from deputy to head greenkeeper? Did you get training support, or was it there you go, get on with it? Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean. I say the, the the world the world is a different place now certainly in our industry so you know that was in ninth, November 1999 and you know I was what was I 26 um, fairly self confident I suppose for want of a better word and I was just headstrong so like let's just get in there and, and and do this so you know there was no sort of like training the things that were available now sort of like through bigger and and the colleges and stuff just wasn't there you know there, there was no ftmi or anything like that so you know i was on, on my own and uh, i just i just i just threw myself into it and made plenty of mistakes along the way but learned from them how long were you in that head greenkeeper's role then uh i was there from the end of 99 to 2005 and uh so i went from cleethorpe to a place it was called cockgrave golf Club. it's now called the nottinghamshire and it was part of the crown golf group uh, oh, I, actually okay. had, I actually handed my notice in the day I found out we were having a, our first child, so the timing wasn't great. <laughs> in, in for a penny, in for a pound. So uh, yeah, so we we upsticked and moved and uh, had had a baby on the way and everything. So so where where was the next place that you ended up then? Yeah, so I say work, working for Crown Golf did just over two yeah. years for them. Um, that was an interesting couple of years. Completely different working for a big sort of like corporate organization. Learned a lot about the, like the business side of it. Um, also learned that it perhaps wasn't for me. I like looking people in the eye when they're telling you they don't want something. Um, it's so much better than talking to a faceless corporation. So uh, yeah. you know, back back to a members 
members club for me. So, and that uh, the next move after that was here at Richmond, and I've been here for just over thirteen years now. Obviously, enjoying it. Um, you've obviously developed through that journey. Where do you think the biggest parts of your development came? I don't know, really. It's interesting. I think I, m- moving with the times has, has, has probably been one of my one of my strengths. For you know, if, if I look at it, because you know, I say the, as the industry's moved and evolved and changed, I've I've kept up with it. I've you know, I've sort of like evolved and changed. So I'm not still stuck back. You know, in the late nineties, I'm you know, I feel like I'm very current and still still moving with the times and like goal for expectation, the trends and stuff, but you know, I've, I've moved with it. And in terms of developing as a manager, what was the biggest help to you? Uh, or, or didn't you get any help? I know you, you kind of jumped straight in. Have you had any support in that respect since you got to Richmond, for instance? Yeah. I mean, since I've been here, you know, I've had some very good, good people um, that I've worked for, you know, my general manager's quite, quite a, a strong character but also you know helpful and you know passes on his sort of like knowledge and skills and stuff and also some of the people that have been on the committees here you know high level businessmen that you know are used to it and they've been really helpful in you know passing on um advice and help and stuff like that so so that's been very good um but i also did the um the management development program with the cma the club managers association of europe and that was yeah. fantastic, you know, not just the sort of like the learning, but sort of like the, the, the peer group that you, you sort of like got to know and sharing ideas and methods and stuff was, was pretty good. So that, you know, that was my, my learning curve in the management side of it. Developing as a manager is one thing. Developing as a, a greenkeeper is another. And you've, you've attained the heights, the highest heights, master greenkeeper. First off, what does that mean to you personally? Um, well, I, I actually passed the Master Greenkeeper thing back in 2004 when I was still up at Cleve Forbes. And uh, the, the main reason we're doing it was every time I heard someone getting it, I always heard the negative stories like, oh, they've only done it because they're a big club and stuff like that. And I thought, oh, well, I'm not one for moaning about stuff, but let's find out. So, that, so I went for it, applied for it, worked bloody hard, and so did my team that were with me at the time. You know, we really worked hard to, to make sure the course was in the shape it needed to be and all the you know all the paperwork and the, the management side of it was good and you know I managed to pass it so so it was a hell of an achievement for me back then you know I wasn't at Richmond um I was at little club Cleethorpe's golf club up in Lincolnshire um, and it was just massive and it's definitely helped um you know sort of like with my the, the the moves that I've made since then so a team effort what you know, we hear Master Greenkeeper has been awarded, and there's been a recent batch um, last couple of weeks, I think. What's involved in actually getting that accreditation? Um, it's sort of like three parts at the moment. So the first part is you have to have sort of like a certain level of history. I think you have to have been ten years in the industry, three years as a head greenkeeper, stroke course manager, um, and you have to have so many sort of like education credits. So that's the first part. And then the second part is a uh, course inspection where you're inspected by two um, current master greenkeepers or if you other places in the world, sometimes they get a, like an American guy that's got the CGCS. Um, so it's a full course inspection where they look at everything. It's not just the agronomy on your greens. They look at, you know, the whole golf course as well as the maintenance facility, you know, sort of like your health and safety risk assessments, your cash, you know, the, the whole managerial side of it as well. Um, so that's sort of like the second part. And then the third part is the uh, the two, three hour exams. Um, so there's a case study where it's one, to like essentially one question where you put a lot of detail in. And then the uh, the other one, which is the, the technical paper with five sort of like technical questions. Um, so you have to pass both papers to, to finally get through it. Uh, and in, in terms of what it's done for you personally is one thing. Do you think it's achieved better standards across the industry um yeah i think people that embrace it um you know as you, as you start through the process you get sent like the, the the grading form and i think everyone that's done it will agree that they go through it and go oh oh i need to improve on that and you'll 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 tick things off that you that you're proficient at and then there's other things that you'll get better at and i think anyone that goes through it and completes completes it all they can definitely look back and go actually you know, the golf course might not be any better, but the operation side of it, you know, will be more 
more in, in control and you know better managed. So. Les, you mentioned earlier that you, you like to stay up with the times. Um, you certainly also seem to want to put something back into the industry. You had a, a stint as chair of Bigger, and now your your role as chairing the Trailblazer part of the Greenkeepers Training Committee uh, is implying to me that that's about bringing them up to speed and, and keeping them up with the with the times. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, I think put, putting things back in. You know, I've, I've, over the years I've had a lot out of sort of being a member of Bigger. So you know, great, be, being chairman was a great honour, and you know, g- giving something back and helping the association grow and develop and what have you was was you know was was important and an amazing honour. And and now with the, uh, the Trailblazer Committee, um, you know, I was involved with the the new Trailblazer Apprenticeship right at the start, and uh, you know, I've, I've like kept involved with it and uh, again it was it was a great honor to be asked and you know be, being involved in it I can make sure that it's fit for purpose you know I, I, we have a couple of apprentices here all you know all the time so like on a rolling rolling thing where you know they finish and then we get new ones in and it, it might, might sound a bit selfish but I want to make sure that it's right for an employer but I also want the youngsters that come through to be in a position to have a lifelong career in greenkeeping. It's not it's not just teaching them how to use a mower anymore, like it used to be. It's a lot more in depth and it really it's a really good foundation to then move on to sort of like the, the advanced greenkeeper and the, the course manager qualification later on. What are you hoping is the end game for that? Is it is it an ongoing role in keeping up with the times or is there actually a finite point at which your your job on that will be done? Yeah, I mean it, it's it's one of these things. I mean having spent a bit of time talking to a couple of government bodies and organizations over the last few months involved in that it's it's constantly being um assessed and evolved and it'll always be changing so ultimately it could it could be a long long long-term role but like everything you know you can't have the same person doing it all the time so eventually it will need new blood and new ideas and you know i i'm not getting any younger i will keep getting older and it'll be it'll be time for someone else eventually what do you think have been the biggest developments or changes in the industry since you've become involved in it? Um, I think the, the level of professionalism. I, mean, I say I've been greenkeeping for 32 years now and, you know, we've really moved away from the old sort of like boiler suit and flat cap, you know, doffing your cap at the member sort of thing. We've, we've moved on from that and, you know, the the professional looking teams that are out there now with smart uniform and you know don't get me wrong they still get dirty when you dig in irrigation holes or whatever it's part of the job but you know there's no reason to just look a mess all the time and i think the Im- you know, that that image is is the probably the biggest thing and so like the professionalism and the way the way we do our job you know is definitely changed what do you think needs to change going forward i mean i i alluded to it earlier about golf clubs and club governance um i think the well-run clubs continue to do well um there's far too many where you know the the governance structure in the club just isn't right and you know the the attitude of people that get into positions where they want to leave their one-year legacy um i want a bunker in here i want to plant this tree whatever it is We've we've all heard the stories and that that really needs to just that just needs to disappear because there's no place for it. And you know, at, at the end of the day, as a, as a course manager, a head greenkeeper, whatever we are, we're custodians of a golf course for a little snapshot in time. You know, we've now got golf clubs that are 150, 200 years old, and you know, Richmond Golf Club will be here long after I've gone. Um, so you know, I'm just looking after it for this little snapshot, and it, it shouldn't just be changed and altered at the whim of you know, a committee member or a captain or something like that. Golf has got a boom at the moment. Uh, Do you think that's going to throw up any opportunities that we should grab hold of for for the industry as a whole, perhaps? Um, Opportunities or threats, it's uh, it's how you look at it, isn't it, really? Um, You know, golf is booming. Um, Richmond Golf was no different. I've never seen it so busy. But what it's doing, it's throwing up um, managerial challenges, you know, more wear on the tees more wear on certain areas of the fairways now. So we have to adapt and change and, and deal with it. Um, industry-wide, um, if, you know, golf clubs need to sort of like look and think, what what is it we want? 
what what level do we expect? Uh, can we afford it? Can can we afford the right level of staffing? Can we afford the right level of you know sort of like materials and products and stuff that we need? Um, so yeah, there's opportunities there. The money's coming in, um, but like you say on the flip side of the coin, the threat is that we don't get the funding, we don't get the right sort of staffing levels, uh, but expectation keeps going up, and everything else goes, the resources go down, and the two will never meet. So. So yes, there's opportunities. There's more money coming into the industry, but say on the flip side of the coin, if it's not invested properly, it you know it could end up being a being a weakness. You touched on the odd captain or committee member wanting to leave a legacy on on their course. Is there a legacy you want to leave behind you for either your course or the industry as a whole? As, as a legacy, uh, probably not. I'd like to think that when I retire from greenkeeping whether i'm still here at richmond or somewhere else the person that takes over from me goes bloody hell it's in good nick you know the soils are good the grasses are good that that's that'll be me you know but that'll be just me doing my job um so i'm not after you know plaques on the wall and things like that um and again you know with the, the work that i've done with bigger and you know the apprenticeship and stuff I'm, I'm not in it for people to talk about me when i'm dead it's you know i'm i'm doing my bit um, I do my best. If it's not right, then I'm sorry. Um, if it's helped people out, then it's been worth doing. But yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not worried about people remembering me and naming bridges after me or anything like that. Les, you've certainly done your bit for the industry. I think you've certainly um, had an impact. Whether that's a legacy that you want or not, you've got one. As far as I'm concerned, um, thank you for your time today. Uh, as always, it's great catching up with you and we hope to see you very, very soon. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and uh, hope everything goes well.